How about not rendering evil for evil? Okay, and some of these, you know, I, I kind of ran out of the ones I've heard. So I actually went on the internet and looked up pacifist websites, and I was looking at the verses that they used to quote that you shouldn't fight. Okay, this is another one that they quoted. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Okay, it says here, Finally be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Now again, you know, first of all, what's the context? Verse 8, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Um, you can't be all of one mind saved and lost. can't happen. And the lost are not our brethren. This is a reference to saved people. Okay? So to try and use this to, to say we should be pacifists and not defend our families against rapists and criminals and things like that, uh, I don't think so. It doesn't work that way. But uh, notice there too, not rendering evil for evil. Okay, what that's saying is, don't take revenge. Now is it revenge? You're there sleeping some night, and all of a sudden you hear some banging on the, the window downstairs, and you, and you come down, and you find out some guy's in your home, and he's going to come up the steps soon to try and hurt you and your wife and children. Um, you didn't do anything about that. You say, well, that's evil, and you're going to send evil back. No, you're going to send punishment. You're going to send protection. Okay, I have the utmost utmost respect and love for wild animals. I really do. Um, if I see a moose out someplace uh, or a bear or whatever else, I want to take a picture of it. I want to look at it and watch it and stuff and watch how it's eating and, and whatever else. That's what I want to do. The last thing I want to do is ever have to shoot one, okay, in defense. I mean, if, if I'm hunting, that's a different story. You know, I'm, I do some hunting now and then, but not for bear or moose, but, you know, they're a little bit more difficult. You got to get licenses and all that other stuff for that. Um, more than just a regular hunting license, but don't want to go off on that subject. But, uh, you know, if I'm threatened, I'm going to try to find a way to get out of it. I don't want to have to kill a moose or a bear. Okay. Um, and it's the same thing with a person. Uh, if I can help it, if I can get away from it, I'm not going to try and kill somebody that's trying to hurt myself or my wife. Um, I'm not going to do that. And uh, that's the way it should be. I don't want to have to render death to that person who's coming to do that to me. But I'm going to if they're going to try and hurt me. So now we've seen the different arguments against the thing of self-defense. Now what about some arguments for self-defense? Let's look at some of these. Luke chapter 22 Luke 22. I kind of referred to this a little bit earlier. The thing of Jesus telling Peter to put up you know, your sword into his place. Why did Peter have a sword? Luke chapter 22, verse 35. It says here, But he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Okay, now I talked about this. I didn't mention this earlier, but I had a couple sermons on the thing of guns. Should Christians have guns and whatever else? Originally on our original sermon audio page when I was back with Bible Believers Fellowship. And that account was deleted for whatever reasons. Um, the brother that was taking care of it, you know, just got away from that and stuff. So that's fine, whatever his decision to make. But uh, I don't have that message up anymore online. I don't know if I'm going to post it or not. We'll have to see. Um, but... The fact of the matter is, I talked about this in a lot of different commentaries, and they're basically trying to get away from the obvious meaning here. And that meaning was, Jesus was telling them to buy a sword. 
And that's why Peter later on, he's got the sword and he's ready to use it because he's thinking, I'm supposed to fight offensively so that we can bring in the kingdom. That way Jesus doesn't have to die on the cross and we can save ourselves all that headache. We'll just bring in the kingdom. No, it wasn't supposed to be that way. Jesus was not telling them, get the sword or a modern day, get a gun so that we can bring in a kingdom. So we can fight and, and fight the forces of the new world order and get rid of Obama and we can get rid of the military industrial complex. And that isn't it. We're not supposed to do that. The reason that you have a sword is for defense. And Jesus Christ is basically saying to them, hey, while I was with you, I can protect you here physically. But in the future, I'm leaving, you're going to have to protect yourselves. That sword was for self-defense, is what that thing was for. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. You say, Brian, you're not proving your point to me. Sorry, Brian, you're just not going to talk me into getting a sword. Well, that's up to you, really. I mean, I can't force it from Scripture. But I can show you the Scriptures that say that you can. Not that you're forced to, but that you can have a weapon for self-defense. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You say, well, Brian, in context, it's talking about money. You're right. You're absolutely right. But let me ask you a question. If I provide for my wife monetarily, but then don't provide for her safety, am I a good husband? No. Some guys there banging on the door trying to get in, going, I'm going to rape you, I'm going to rape you, I'm going to rape you. And, I, and my wife is there screaming, saying, what are we going to do? And I say, well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to get in the, in the closet and hide. I'm going to curl up in a little ball and, and suck my thumb while the, while the guy's breaking through the door. She says, well, are you going to protect me when he gets in? No. You know, what am I? I'm worse than an infidel. I'm not willing to fight for my wife. The protector. Be kind of weird. Now let's go back to the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter eight. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. It says here, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with him, with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. You know another good argument for the thing of self-defense? You say, what's that? You need to execute judgment speedily. So what are you talking about? Well, I told this story years ago um, when I was doing my original sermon on the thing of weapons and Christians. And uh, there was a situation where an older man was riding his bicycle through a park, a city park. And three gang youths decided that they were going to rob the guy and stab him and beat him and whatever else. And he pulled his gun, killed two of them, and the third one escaped and was picked up later on by police. You say, well, that's a terrible thing. Yeah, it was terrible that they made this decision to hurt an old man. But you see, that guy executed wrath. He executed judgment. He had, you know, basically the trial, the verdict, and the execution all in about probably 20 or 30 seconds. And you say, well, that, that's a terrible thing. Well, it's terrible what they were trying to do to him. Why is it that people never think about the victim? They always think about the criminals. Well, those poor criminals, if they would have just had a chance, somebody could have talked to them, they could, might have been reformed, or maybe we could have put them in prison for 10 years and let them do weightlifting and, and go through college courses so that when they come out, they're more dangerous. No. Remember what Paul said? If I do anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. See, these guys coming up to him and trying to mug him, trying to, trying to hurt the guy, and he, bang, 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 kills him. Now, let's just say that he wouldn't have done that. 
let's say that these three youths would have come up and would have knocked the guy down and would have beaten him, put him in the hospital, maybe even killed him. Uh, there was another situation down in Pennsylvania where, I'm, where I was from where there was a man and he was in his home and, and one day he got a, gets a knock on the door and he comes to the door and there's these gang youth, you know, and gangster youth and they just pulled a gun out and started killing him. Just shot him right dead right on his front steps of his house. You know why? Because that was the initiation into the gang. He wanted to be a tough guy. The one gangster guy. And they caught him and they put him in jail and stuff like that. But he'll be out in a few years. You say, uh, what should have happened? Somebody should have killed that gangster youth. Why? Well, because judgment wasn't executed speedily. His heart is now going to be fully set in him to do evil. Why? He got away with it. See? When you somebody tries to come and they try to do something evil and you are able to judge them quickly, problem solved. But when they get away with it, now they're more emboldened and they're going to get worse in the future. Mm -hmm. And if you study history, you'll see that every time there's pacifists in a country and that country goes falls apart and the military rises up, they have military coup or there's a guerrilla army or whatever, they always go after the pacifist first. Why? They kill one pacifist, nobody shot back. Hey, this is kind of easy. There's another pacifist. Pfft, I got that one. Hey, they didn't fight back. Let's go get some more pacifists. You see? Their heart is fully set in them to do evil because nobody's stopping them. Nobody's fighting against them, saying, hey, whoa, 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 this is inappropriate. You're going to come in here, I'm going to shoot you. See? That's reality, people. That's what the Bible's teaching here. Okay? I mean, if you want to live in your little fantasy world that, that everything's going to get better once everybody's disarmed, go ahead and believe that. But that's not what the Bible says is coming in the future. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 18. You say, well, Brian, I can't have a, a firearm in the country where I live. I can't have a firearm in the city where I live or whatever. Well, then you can remember this. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 18. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Wisdom is better than weapons of war? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of ways that you can defend yourself that don't even involve firearms. There are a lot of uh, improvised weapons. I'm not talking about explosives or pipe bombs or something illegal to make. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, I had a, a friend that worked in a hardware store. I know I told this story in my other sermon, but... Um, he worked in a hardware store back in the paint department, and he said, if we ever have some guy come in, he said, I'm going to grab whatever I can from these store shelves, cans of paint or, or glass bottles that I can break and throw at the guy or, or whatever. Grab a handful of, of wood screws or something and just throw it right in the guy's face. See, it's up here. This isn't necessarily it. There are people that will have a gun on, and they're tough, big talkers, and they get into a time where there's that stress level comes up and, and the threat level's up where, uh-oh, I'm going to get hurt, and they freeze up. They don't even pull their gun out. See? So you get it figured out up here. I'm not a violent person. I don't, I'm not looking for trouble. But if somebody's going to threaten me or other innocent people, I'm going to take care of the situation. Why? I don't want them to, that criminal over there, I don't want them to be emboldened to do it to other people and go out and hurt other people, other innocent people. See, that's what's going on there. I want to show you something interesting here. Revelation chapter 14. I referred to this a little bit earlier, but this is something that's uh, very interesting. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, let me just say this. Right now, I really don't know what's on the other side of them trees over there. Okay, 
And I can talk all I want about what probably is on the other side of them trees over there, but until I'm actually over there on the other side of those trees, I can't really say for sure. Now, if you look in the Gospels, Jesus different times is dropping little hints at the church age, which is coming up. And they're going, huh? What? They don't understand. And in like manner, right now, there's some times, or there's some things in the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming up that you can say that you understand it all you want, but uh, until you're really there, you're not going to get it. And as the body of Christ, we're going to be leaving before that time comes. Now, I've seen lost people that are very, very wicked. I've seen some of the most horrible, most offensive people. Tattooed, they smell like cigarettes, they're drinking alcohol, they're rough, cussing, drunkard people, and they get saved and change. New life in Christ Jesus. I've seen that. I've seen people that are involved in the occult get saved. I've seen all kinds of stuff like that. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, according to the Bible, you have people that take the mark of the beast, and there will be good people, hardworking, nice, friendly, wonderful people, take that mark of the beast, and they're done. No chance to be forgiven ever again. So, you know, right now, you have somebody that comes and tries to do me bodily harm, and I'm thinking in my mind, if there's some way I can get out of this thing, I don't want to kill that person because they're going to end up in hell. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, you see people that have that mark of the beast, and I do believe it's in the hand and in the forehead, but Revelation chapter 20 also says upon the forehead. So I think that there might be a visible mark upon the forehead, maybe a QR code or some other thing, and, you know, a digital uh, tattoo as they call them now, which they have them out. You can find that if you look it up on the internet. But um, in that time period, when you see somebody like that, they can't get saved. That's going to put a whole new spin on the thing of defense in that time period. I mean, if I was going to go into that time period and I'm back trying to protect my wife and if I had children, let's say at that point in time, and we're back there and everything and all of a sudden I see these people roaming around and stuff and I get in my scope with one of my guns and I look and I see that old mark right there, I don't have any worries about, hey, that guy might get saved eventually, maybe if I can go out and talk to him. They're lost. That's why the Lord has absolutely zero mercy when it comes to that, that Antichrist army. He just comes down and just, just destroys them. Flattens them out and says, okay, let's go ride through their dead corpses. Blood and stuff all over the place. See, I can't understand that. I can't understand it right now. I still have a, a level of mercy. There are still lost people that I pray for on a, on a daily occurrence. You know, very, very wicked lost people. And I pray for them. You know, and I never would want to shoot them in defense or anything else, you know, and hopefully that would never come to that. But the fact is, in the time of Jacob's trouble, the situation is very, very different. And the Bible says that peace is going to be taken from the earth. So wherever you're at, even if you're hidden very, very well, um, you're going to be dealing with some people that are roving around in bands trying to hunt you down and kill you and take what you have. And I do believe that there's going to be, as part of the whole time of Jacob's trouble, I think that the economic collapse is going to happen and that there are going to be people that are desperate and they're going to be doing desperate things. And I think being armed in that time period is not even going to be an option. It's going to be something that is going to be absolutely required for survival. And of course, most people that get saved in that time period won't survive. So it's a bad situation. But again, this teaching of pacifism, how does it fit? How does it fit into the Bible? The only time I can see where pacifism is justifiable, total, complete pacifism, never fighting back, is when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth for the Millennial Kingdom. That's the only time I can see pacifism making sense. But you say then uh, we shouldn't be pacifist at all today, right? Well, let's look about that. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to show you actually two places where pacifism works. You say, wait a second, you're, you got a Glock on and you're talking about pacifism as actually a good idea in some cases? Yeah, strange, isn't it? Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or 
sword. Look at verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see it there. There is a sense in which, you know, if you're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake, if, if we're going to be persecuted as Christians, I mean, if they pass laws saying that Bible-believing Christians are to be rounded up and brought to camps and mass exterminated, like what happened in Nazi Germany with the, with the Jews, and there were others too that got executed in those camps, you know, if that happens, um, you have to pray about that. You have to see what the Lord wants you to do at that time period. Do you have wife and, and children to take care of? Well, something to think about. Okay. Um, if that happens, you have to keep in mind that there's nothing that's going to separate you from the love of God. Okay. Uh, well, he's allowing you to go through that. Why? Well, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Um, the body of Christ has been counted as sheep for the slaughter many, many times throughout church history. You had all the uh, Catholic persecution down through the centuries. You had Bloody Mary over there in England, you know, killing hundreds of Christians and burning them at the stake and torturing them. And Christians have gone through some rough times. And that certainly could happen again here in America and in some of the other countries, people that watch this uh, ministry regularly. We could all go through that persecution at some point in time. And if, if they're coming to your house and they're saying, we're going to kill you because you're a Christian, well, if you break out the automatic rifles and break out all the, you know, whatever weaponry and you're, you're taking down soldiers and police officers and whatever else, they're just going to ramp up their persecution that much more. It's going to be the ultimate uh, um, thing that they want for the news media. The news media is going to make us look like terrorists or whatever else. So... Pray about that. Um, that's a difficult issue. You know, a very difficult issue. But again, see, we're talking about religious persecution, political persecution. We're not talking about some guy that's, that's on bath salts and he's crazy in his mind or he's on methamphetamines or something like this and he's looking for money and he's breaking into your home and he's going to rape you and your children, you know, and molest, you know, you and your wife and your children or something. I mean, there, there are some sick people out there. At that point in time, you know, you might have to take care of the situation with defense, defensive measures. One more place to look up here. Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Come on here. Pages are getting bent. Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Okay, it says here, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. You always love it when saved people can cause the lost to you know, unify, unify in their hatred for a Christian. Uh, verse 58, And cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's challenging. You know, Stephen had the spiritual in mind. Okay, he was thinking spiritually. He had every right to say, whoa, 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 and try to run away and get away from those people or, or kind of push them off or whatever and, and try to get out of there so they didn't stone him to death. But you see, he had spiritual things in mind. He was willing to die for Jesus Christ. We might all have to face that eventually. I don't know. I can't say. You know? And again, he's being persecuted because of his religious faith. Ironically, because he spoke against the temple. 
look out for that. But uh, again, this is not some guy trying to rob him, some guy trying to kill him or his family. This is religious persecution. Uh, is that different? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, it's this is an issue that's a very, very touchy issue. I realize that. But I think in light of history, in light of the fact that the Bible does not openly condemn self-defense, you know, you look at all these different situations, it's always non-life-threatening. But you have somebody threatening your life, you should execute judgment against them speedily so that they aren't emboldened to do worse things to people in the future. So uh, this was a sermon request, like I said. I wanted to put this thing together. And um, as for myself, uh, I am a gun owner, and I th am thankful that I can have firearms. Uh, I would be in real problems if I could have no guns at all and I live out here in the wilderness like this. Uh, I'd, have, I'd have some issues. I don't exactly want to go against a thousand pound uh, moose or you know, a couple hundred pound black bear. Um, <laughs> You know, and I've been in areas too. I've been in Alaska. I've been in Montana, you know, and, and I'm used to walking around through woods that are infested with mountain lions and, and uh, grizzly bears and things like that and moose, you know, Alaskan moose. Um, but uh, so I know about that thing. I know that it's, it's a dangerous thing to walk around where there are game, where there's animal that, animals that are very, very big and can get very nasty. So I'm glad for firearms for that purpose. And uh, I also, you know, occasionally I go into an area where it's dangerous, out in a city or whatever else, and, I, and a lot of times I'm armed when I go to a place like that. You say, why is that? Because I know reality, and I know that there are some very sick people out there, and uh, I will stop them from hurting my wife. You say, well, I don't agree. You have that right. But I think it's a rather stupid thing to die at the hands of a rapist or some kind of a murderer or whatever else. You say, well, God can protect me, Brian. Yeah, God can protect you. And God can protect you, too, if you walk blind, folded down a highway the wrong way. You know, I mean, you say, well, that's not much faith. Well, you know, that's up to you. Okay? I can't teach it from the Bible that you're forced to have a weapon. I can't teach that you're forced not to have a weapon. Uh, it's, it's really a matter of, of liberty, brethren. Um, if you are in an area where you can have firearms, if you're in an area like this where you need a firearm, certainly carry one, be good with it, you know, know how to use it, and try to avoid it. I mean, try to avoid having to use the thing. But uh, I guess that's going to be it for the sermon for today. Uh, like I said, I had originally had a couple of these sermons online where I could point people to them, but they're not there anymore, so... I wanted to put another one together. And uh, so let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for truth that we can know that uh, looking at the proof of history, looking at your word, that there have been very violent times in history where it is a good thing to be able to defend yourself. And uh, Lord, I just pray for everyone out there that they would be able to make these decisions and uh, that they would feel at peace about whatever decision they decide to make. And uh, Lord, I do pray that we would not get sidetracked on such issues, and uh, that we would stay focused on eternal things and on things that really truly matter. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, want to do, I do want to say about that here in conclusion, and that is don't get sidetracked on the gun issue. Okay, I personally have subscribed to a lot of the gun channels on uh, YouTube and I'd watch a lot of gun videos and you know and, and uh, a lot of those guys are very lost very profane you know when they when it comes to their speech they use a lot of profanity and um, they end up you know causing you to covet guns that you don't have and you end up having to buy the latest gun and all this other stuff don't fall for that okay um, if you decide to have a firearm or get a firearm, certainly uh, study it a little bit. I mean, I think that you should study it, but uh, don't study it to the point where you're forsaking the things of the Lord, okay? So, 
I think that's going to be it. I have some work to do here today and uh, tomorrow and things. So still working on the property and, and around the ministry headquarters. Always something to do. So uh, next week we're going to be doing a sermon on the Sabbath day. Whether you should worship on the Sabbath day or on Sunday. I'm going to record it today so you'll see it next week. But uh, because of all the work that's going on right now, and I'm doing a study too on uh, some other things. I don't want to say, don't want to spoil the surprise. But I'm um, going to be bringing out some good messages here, Lord willing, in the future. And uh, it's very, very detailed, a lot of work going into them. So that's why I need to do two sermons here in advance. So that's going to be it for this study. We will see you next week, and we will talk about the Sabbath day and what we should do about the Sabbath day and whatever. And uh, we'll see about that. So thank you for watching. Please keep us in your prayers.